On the Friday evening of September 6, 2008, Macy Ogic and Shannon Alexander attended a high school dance at the Manawaki Arena in Manawaki, Quebec, Canada. After the dance, the two girls planned to spend the night at Shannon's house, just north of the Kittigan Zibi First Nation. Shannon's dad, Brian Alexander, had gone to Ottawa that evening to help his son paint his house. When Shannon's father returned to his apartment, he found the girls had left behind their purses, wallets, and backpacks. Shannon had even left her medication. No one has seen Maisie Ogic or Shanna Alexander since. What happened to Maisie Ogic and Shannon Alexander? Maisie Ogic was born on November 6, 1991. She is 6 feet tall and has brown hair and brown eyes and weighs 125 pounds. She has a dark complexion and piercings on her nostrils and lip. She lived in Kittigan, Zibi, First Nation in Quebec, Canada. Her best friend, Shannon Alexander, lived in nearby Manawaki, Quebec. Shannon is 5 foot 9 inches tall and has brown hair and brown eyes and weighs 141 pounds. She has a scar on her left knee and piercings in her ears and navel. Born on March 29, 1991, Shannon was also a First Nations Canadian. Shannon was looking forward to attending nursing school later in the fall. Maisie Ogic lived with her grandparents, Liz Ogic and Earl McGregor. She was the oldest of four children. She loved being the big sister, taking care of her siblings. Shannon lived in a fourplex in Manawaki with her father, Brian Alexander, who had been a single parent since Shannon was born. Shannon had a love for animals. She was known to have five pets in her room at one point. Maisie and Shannon were typical teenage girls. They went to high school, gossiped about boys, and frequented popular hangouts. Neither girl had ever been in trouble with the law, nor led high-risk lifestyles. The last time Maisie's mother, Lori Ogic, saw her daughter was Friday, September 5th, 2008. Maisie and Shannon were mowing Maisie's grandmother's lawn. Normally, Maisie did this on Saturday. When Lori asked why they were mowing on Friday, Maisie told her that she and Shannon were going to a dance that night, and then she planned to stay the night at Shannon's. Shannon's dad was going to be out of town helping his son paint his house in Ottawa. Lori didn't think too much about it, since Maisie frequently stayed at Shannon's house. On the evening of September 5th, Maisie and Shannon attended the dance at Manawaki Arena. Other friends who were at the dance saw the girls leave together. Maisie's brother, Damon, said he bumped into his sister that evening. They talked briefly and then went separate ways with their respective friends. Shannon's father, Brian Alexander, was last to see Shannon and Maisie. Shannon dropped Brian off at the bus stop on the morning of the 6th while Maisie was still asleep at the apartment. On September 7th, Macy's mother, Lori, got a call from Macy's grandmother, Lisa, stating that she hadn't heard from Macy. The two women weren't alarmed at first. They figured that Macy had just slept in and that she would call later. Brian returned on the 7th. When he arrived home, Macy and Shannon were not there. The apartment was locked and the dog had been left outside. Even odder was that he found the girls' purses, wallets, and backpacks. He also found a shattered light bulb by the computer. He would later find bloody shards of glass in his garbage can. Brian's apartment was never searched, so the bloody shards were never collected for testing. Lori spent the 8th calling all of Macy's friends, asking if they had seen or heard from her. None of them had. Lisa visited an anxious Brian, and the two of them concluded that the two girls were missing. They contacted the police on September 9th. 
Since Macy lived in the Kittigan Zibi First Nation and Shannon lived in the city of Maniwaki, their disappearance was handled by two different police departments. Macy's case was handled by the Kittigan Zibi Police and Shannon's was covered by the Quebec Provincial Police. Worse, the police initially classified the two girls as runaways. Due to the runaway classification, little action was taken by the police department. The police didn't have any evidence of foul play, which led to the runaway status. Macy and Shannon had the same issues most teenagers do. The police used these to support their runaway supposition. Almost a year before she disappeared, Macy dropped out of school. Lori knew Macy was experimenting with marijuana and alcohol. At 16, Macy moved in with her 18-year-old boyfriend, an arrangement that lasted about a month. She next moved in with her grandmother. Macy made no secret of her desire to get away from Kittigan Zibby. She often spoke about moving back to the Saugeen Shores, Port Elgin, Ontario area, where she lived from 2003 to 2006, and where she still has friends and family. Brian Alexander says his daughter, Shannon, would sometimes leave home for a few days, but never without calling or leaving a note. She had spent some months in a foster home at some point in the past few years, but he isn't clear on the details. The police made no effort and gathered little to no evidence during the first month after Macy and Shannon disappeared. The Kittigan Zibby First Nations set up a press conference. Macy and Shannon's families put up posters, searched the local area, and canvassed the nearby cities of Ottawa, Ontario, and Gatineau. It took the police department a month to inform the public about the disappearance of Macy and Shannon. Brian Alexander's apartment was never searched. Macy and Shannon's computers were not searched for three weeks. No evidence was found that the two of them had planned to run away. Lori openly criticized the Kittigan Zibby police as being slow and unprepared in the handling of Macy's disappearance. Kittigan Zibby police chief Gilbert White Duck would later admit that they had mishandled the investigation. White Duck preferred not to focus on these failures, but saw it as a learning opportunity for future cases. A year later, the Ontario Provincial Police would join the Quebec Provincial Police. On September 19th, Lori Ajik arranged for a search in Ottawa, Ontario. A group of 20 volunteers gathered together and canvassed Ottawa and Gatineau, questioning passers-by posting at businesses and bus stops, and visually searching for the two girls. Despite all efforts, no new information was found. On September 23rd, Lori arranged for a river search of the Kittigan Zibi and Ashinabeg First Nation. They also had two boats searching in the nearby Gatineau River. Maria Jacko, Maisie's aunt, encouraged the police to enlist the help of Search and Rescue Global One, a nonprofit search organization. A five mile area around Shannon's apartment was searched on December 7, 2008. With 25 Global One searchers and 35 local volunteers, the Ottawa Valley Search and Rescue Dog Association brought a team of six members and two dogs. The Kittigan Zibby Police and Council also assisted. In all, over 100 searchers participated. Winter weather, fallen trees, and rough terrain made for a difficult search. Again, nothing was found. The Kittigan Zibby First Nation was searched again on May 3, 2009, by 240 volunteers. All that was found was a sweater that the police deemed was too small to belong to Maisie or Shannon. Later, bones were found just outside the First Nation's lands, but these turned out to be from an animal. Maisie's Facebook page was last active at 10.30 on the night they disappeared. It is unclear where she was and when she visited the page. The most recent clue came in 2017. Maisie Ojik's mother, Lori, got a tip about where the girls' bodies might be found. The police interviewed that person who drew a picture of the area near Pittoburgh Creek on the Kittigan Zibby Reserve. In the spring, when the water receded and the ground thawed, a diving team from Montreal scoured the water in an area next to the Manawaka Raceway. Learning that the racetrack had expanded since 2008, which disrupted the bank, a hole was dug near the racetrack and the police sifted through the dirt. No new clues were found during this search. 
the Montreal police also conducted further interviews with 20 persons of interest in hopes of finding new leads in the case. Nothing has come to fruition. Due to the long gap in the investigation, there are few clues in the disappearance of Maisie Ogic and Shannon Alexander. One theory involved a serial killer named Jacques Babier, who is 39 years old. He lives six miles from Macy and Shannon. Jacques, who killed himself while serving a 10-month sentence for sexually assaulting a 14-year-old, left a suicide note. It is unclear if Jacques implicated himself in the disappearance of Macy and Shannon, but a prison guard did forward Jacques note to the police working on their case. There was also a warning on the Kittigan Zibby police Facebook page about a young girl who allegedly escaped a prostitution ring that had come to Manawaki to abduct more women. It is unclear if this is connected to Maisie and Shannon's disappearance. There was an unsubstantiated account posted on Web Sleuths about a 15-year-old boy who said that later in the evening, the girls hang out at a park across from where the dance was being held. In this account, the dance was not held at the Manawaki Key Arena, but at the Paula Valente High School. He says the girls claimed they were smoking crack. Shannon got into a fight with a boy in the group, after which Shannon and Macy left. The biggest problem with this claim is that this school does not show up on a Google map search as being in Manawaki, but a town three hours away. Also, the story has not been collaborated by other witnesses. The disappearance of Maisie Ogic and Shannon Alexander is still open and unsolved. If you know anything about the disappearance of Maisie Ogic and Shannon Alexander, please call the Quebec Provincial Police at 1-418. 623-6249. You can also call 613-882-7907 or leave an email on the http www.findmacyandshannon.com website, which is maintained by Macy's aunt, Marie Jocko. Please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And if you or anyone you know has a loved one that is missing, please fill out our case submission form. There is a link in this video's show notes.